Good afternoon, church. Pastor Kevin Newsom here with our final video that I'm going to do on the Seven Arrows, the Seven Arrows book by Matt Rogers and Donnie Mathis. I have been doing uh, this videos on this book for you for uh, the past few weeks now. It's hard to believe that we've come to the last video, the sixth of this series. Um, and today I'm going to be doing arrows, arrows six and seven. So just to recap, um, we have arrow one, what does this passage say? Arrow two, what does this passage mean to its original audience? Arrow three, what does this passage tell us about God? Arrow four, what does this passage tell us about man? Arrow five, what does this passage demand of me? And today we'll go over arrow six. What does this passage change? How does this passage change the way I relate to people? And arrow seven, what does this passage prompt me to pray? Uh, remember, there are uh, a, a, a there's a reference guide, the seven arrows, quick reference guide, a printout available on the Facebook group, uh, and you can email me as well, and I'll send that to you, knewsome at malvernhill.org. Um, and you can print these out. There are four to a page. Cut them up, stick them in your Bible, put them on cardstock, laminate them, whatever you want to do, so that when you're studying your Bible, you'll have these and uh, just a quick reference to be able to go through each of these seven steps so that you can get the most out of your Bible study. And we do hope that you are spending some extra time uh, doing more in-depth Bible study uh, as you uh, potentially have more time at home. Though for those of you who are spending more time at home, we hope that you are also spending more time studying your Bible. So arrow number six. Six, how does this passage change the way I relate to people? So let's, let me mention uh, a little bit about isolationism right here. So the Word of God should not be read or obeyed in isolation. God has called us to a community within himself. That's, that's why we have churches. That's why we have congregations. The New Testament church is our example of this. And I think we, we can, we're we really getting a sense of how important community is during this time when we are separated from each other uh, because of quarantine and everything. So uh, hopefully you're beginning to understand just how important community is. Um, this uh, separation is not natural. Sin caused separation from God. Since we are in creating God's image, sin separates us from each other and uh, separates us from anything that bears God's image. So the gospel is that uniting factor that we become uh, united, uh, reunited back to the Father by means of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, and the presence of God then begins to unify us with those who bear the image of God again as well. And we begin to uh, return to that sense of community that we were designed to be a part of. So when we're talking about uh, uh, gospel things and, 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 and passages, if we simply just change the application pronoun from I to we, we begin to uh, uh, take this application and apply it to community, which is what Arrow 6 is all about. Uh, so rather than just saying, I am forgiven and united in Christ, we are forgiven. We are united to Christ. We have the joy of learning to live, obey, and serve Christ together. So we change this pronoun in the application process, uh, and we begin to understand how passages can relate to community and when it relates to community uh, the passage then informs us through uh, additional application on how we can relate to others through that so we started uh, the first three arrows were, were all about context um, uh, uh, first four arrows were all about context and understanding understanding what we're reading and then arrow five we started uh, the process of application and arrow, uh, arrow five is the application directly to us. Arrow six is then the application to community. So when we talk about application outside of ourselves, uh, there are three main things we want to look at, uh, three main areas. The first is family. We begin with the people that are closest to us. Our spouses should be affected by the word that transformed within within us. Our children should see that the word see the word as it transforms us. So we start with our families. The second uh, part of community is our church. Uh, Christians were not uh, Christians were always expected to experience their faith together. Uh, isolation is not biblical. Corporate gatherings are biblical. There are certain biblical commands and certain biblical expectations that we can't carry out, we can't follow by ourselves. It can't be done in isolation. Uh, it is through community that we can then 
further our obedience through these commands and these expectations and it's the local church that provides us a place to 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 practice these things and, and to be able to uh take them from the church together as a community as we've worked these uh, part these things out and then bring them out further into the community to with the gospel um and uh some of these com the commands may necessitate long-term relationships um and uh, so churches allow us a place to build those long-term relationships. If, if you're changing churches quickly, when conflict arises, instead of investing in unity and, and trying at least at least trying your best to invest in unity through conflict, or maybe you're not allowing yourself to get involved, uh, you're keeping yourself at arm's distance, you're not getting to know people. These things stifle your ability to be fully obedient to Scripture because you cannot be fully obedient in a vacuum. You cannot be fully obedient in isolation. Your obedience needs community. Uh, and the third aspect of community is the mission. These are people that are outside the church. Ultimately, our obedience to Scripture should uh, bring the kingdom of God and the beauty of the gospel to people who need Jesus. We, corporately, are chosen to be God's ambassadors. So relationships are key in every situation. Uh, community is important to biblical obedience, and that's where we find ourselves with Arrow 6. How does this passage change the way I relate to people, the way I relate to community? Arrow number 7, what does this passage prompt me to pray? So now that we've made application, we're going to take arrow seven. We're going to sort of uh, pray these things back uh, to God. The Bible is living. It speaks to us. It demands a response, not just through, uh, through change, but also through prayer. Reading the Word of God should be part of the conversation, part of our conversation with God. So the seven arrows gives you a plan for your prayer time. It helps you to pray biblically informed prayers that are in line with God's word. You go through all of these arrows and then you get to a landing place where you where you have a complete understanding of what the scripture is saying, how it can apply in, in uh, situations both to yourself and to other people. And now you are uh, more informed to pray. It gives you this plan to pray uh, in line with God's word, uh, so we get uh, four arrows. There are uh, four areas uh, of prayer. Conviction uh, happens. Will, will it, this illuminates areas in your life that you may not have thought about as places uh, that need prayer and repentance? Uh, and through prayer, we need consistency. Consistent Bible study leads us to consistent prayer life. Confidence as you as you are pray through the scriptures that you've diligently studied through this process, you can have confidence that you're praying in God's will. Well, it also uh, brings some um, brings brings the prayer into a specific place, and it helps you to avoid generic prayers, and, and it helps you to pray specifically for specific things that have been revealed to you through the through scripture. So when you're praying, pray uh, rep with repetition petition, pray the exact words of scripture back to God uh, through this passage, change the pronouns, make it personal, make it about community, see, see if you can uh, use that scripture to more biblically inform your prayer. Um, and you can uh, th uh, pray through uh, composition by using the seven arrows to build prayers. Uh, as you've studied, so you can build a prayer by uh, by by going through the seven arrows and writing down specific things that you want to pray about. All right, so that's those are arrows six and seven, and now we're going to look at the passage uh, to practice. And I'm going to take you through all seven arrows so that you can see how these things work together. I'm going to be looking at Luke chapter five verses twenty nine through thirty two. And it says, And Levi gave a big reception for him, that is Jesus, in his house. And, and there was a great um, crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with them. The Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said to them, It is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. 
So let's look, break this passage down using the seven arrows. Arrow number one, what does this passage say? The plain meaning of the text as we have read it. Uh, so Levi is the Apostle Matthew who wrote the first gospel. This happens, uh, this particular passage happens immediately after Matthew's call to be a disciple. So in response to his new relationship, in response to Jesus pointing him out and calling him, Matthew hosts a big reception, a dinner at his home. There are lots of undesirables there. Uh, it, uh, scripture tells us tax collectors and sinners. So lots of undesirables were there as guests. And the Pharisees were at least, if they weren't in attendance, they were at least lurking around watching and everything and so they began to grumble about it and question Jesus' disciples about it but Jesus is the one who answers Jesus compares sinners to sick people in need of a doctor and by extension uh, and in doing this he calls himself the doctor they need so that's error number one what does this passage say error number two what did this passage mean to its original audience so Luke is our writer here Gentiles were the primary audience for Luke. And once again, we see Luke pointing out Jesus reaching people uh, the Jews might consider undesirable. This would have been important to Gentiles, that Jesus was not just a Savior, not just a Messiah to Jews, but that Jesus wanted to reach the people that the Jews didn't like. Uh, Matthew's version of this has Jesus quoting scripture back to the Pharisees. But Jewish scripture wouldn't have, had, wouldn't have had much meaning to Luke's audience. So he omits that scripture. The Gentiles wouldn't have known it. But uh, Matthew's audience or, was to Jews. So quoting the scripture back to them meant something to Matthew's audience. We don't see that in, in Luke's writing because of Luke's audience. In Matthew, Jesus tells them uh, to learn what the scriptures mean by I desire obedience and that's not sacrifice. That's the scripture that Jesus quotes. Mark also omits this scripture, uh, but points out in Mark, it's pointed out that these sinners were following Jesus. So that we, we see in Mark that this just isn't a one-time event, which fits with um, Mark's emphasis of the people's need for a savior above and beyond their need for what the Pharisees had to offer and above and beyond what they, uh, uh, what they had come to expect from everyday Jewish religion. So uh, Mark shows this as, as a lifestyle of following Jesus, not just an extension of the temple. Um, so the audience would have seen some of this uh, as a dismissal of self-righteousness when Jesus is talking to these Pharisees. So that's arrow number two. Arrow number three, what does this passage tell us about God? A couple of things we can pull out pretty easily. I'm not going to go into extreme detail with some of these, um, but uh, arrows one and two are the ones that have the most detail. We can spend so much time in arrow two getting context. Uh, and now we're past arrow two. This is going to come a little bit faster. Uh, arrow number three, what does this passage tell us about God? We see that God cares for the outcasts. God loves us where we are. Uh, he loves us as sinners. He knows we need him. He knows we're sick. He knows we need a doctor. And he's come to give us, the, uh, give us healing from our sin. He's come to us because we need him. Uh, God, we also see that God has little patience for the self-righteous. But he wants us to see and obey him in humility. Uh, he wants us to be authentic. Uh, he doesn't want us to put on these airs of self-righteousness. That's error number three. Error number four, what does this passage tell us about man? Well, it tells us that self-righteousness can blind us to our own sickness and our own need for a savior. Uh, it also tells us that even in our sin, we don't have to think of ourselves as separated from God. God still loves us even though we're sinners. Arrow number five. What does this passage demand of me? Now we're getting into the application part of this. It demands us uh, that we admit our own state of sinfulness and to stop any form of self-righteousness. It uh, demands that we see sinners as God sees sinners. People in need of a Savior, in need of reaching with the gospel, now, no matter how undesirable they may be. It demands us to see people the way God sees people. 
Uh, how does this passage change the way I relate to people? It should help us to have compassion on the lost, compassion on the sin, on sinners, to give us a sense of urgency to reach them. Um, we should we should uh, uh, be honest uh, and and not self righteous in front of our family and our church family. This is arrow number six. How does this passage change the way I relate to people? Uh, it, it should change the way we present ourselves, and and so that we're not pretending to be something we're not. And finally, arrow number seven. How does this passage prompt me to pray? We can pray that God would reveal areas of self-righteousness and disobedience to us. We can pray that God would give us a heart for sinners to reach them we reach them where they are, to go to them with the life-changing message of the gospel. Those are arrows number 1 through 7 um, on Luke chapter 5, verses 29 through 32. So God's word was not designed to fix our problems in air quotes. It is designed to transform us from the inside out. This transform, this transforming the process will grow, a, uh, should grow in us a desire to see others transform. So proper application of scripture not only changes us personally, but prompts us to engage others with scripture and informs us how to pray. These seven arrows are designed to help you walk through passages so that you can do just that and do it in a, a biblically proper way without accidentally getting ahead of ourselves and without accidentally making scripture about us, without getting something wrong. If you follow these arrows and do them in order, you will uh, come away from your biblical study enriched uh, in, in a much better way. So I uh, remind you about the seven arrows quick reference guide. Download it. Print it. Uh, it's on the Facebook group. I will also send it to you in email if you ask me to. Um, use that as a way to study your Bible. Thank you for watching. I hope these videos have helped you uh, enrich your Bible study, and I hope that you're spending time uh, doing that during these days. Thank you again, and God bless.